This is Star Talk Sports Edition. The title of this episode is The Space Cowboy. Ooh, we'll find out more about that in a moment. Let me first introduce my co host, Gary O'Reilly. Gary, former hey, soccer Neil. pro. Always yep, good to have great you. Great to be here again. All right. And you're also a former sports commentator. Uh, I'm still the, commentating, yes. Still commentating. Okay. Yeah, I'm still out there. The game's gone into extra time. I'm still yes, commentating. Exactly. Well, you used to commentate uh, soccer, and now you come stateside, and you're with us on Star Talk. We're delighted yeah. to have you as a former pro athlete. And, of course, Chuck Nice, who's not a former pro anything. This right? is true. Okay. <laughs> Long-time yeah, yeah. Star, Star Talk co-host, comedian, mm-hmm. and actor, we add to your resume. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, Very I'm, nice. A, I'm often acting like a comedian. <laughs> 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 Okay. <laughs> All right, Gary, give me the show overview and who do you got for us this time? You see, Neil, we all want to go to space. Um, seems like fun. We can get to float around up there in microgravity. As long as, long as there's enough money to as long as there's enough money to bring me back, I'll go into Good space. Good idea. Yes. Always get a return <laughs> ticket. Um, <laughs> but the whole thing is, what if you had to spend weeks, months, years in space? You know, what if it was your job? How do you prepare a human body to spend an elongated period of time in microgravity? What impact? Yeah, a living body. What, <laughs> what, uh, yeah. what impact does microgravity have on the body? How do you adapt to life in space? Um, and when you come back, how does it react to full gravity? So all of the answers to those questions are going to help us understand how better to travel into space and not have detrimental effects to our being. Um, I mean, it's going to influence so much of space travel in the future. Now, for th- if, if we're going to be a space-faring yeah. species, yeah. I mean, otherwise we're trapped mm-hmm. here on this little blue marble, and that may not be the mm-hmm. best idea as things go forward. So okay. for these answers to these questions, we need some serious, serious expertise. We have, later on in the show, the space doc, Dr. Shana Gifford. Her expertise is rehabilitation, and in particularly for astronauts. But what if imagine you had an an NFL athlete and put that athlete into space? It seems like, you know, the rarest of beings, but that's exactly what we have as our first guest. (laughs) Leland Melvin is a former NFL wide receiver with the Detroit Lions and the Dallas Cowboys. He has been on two space missions on the shuttle Atlantis. I mean, he's logged over 500 hours in space. He's also an author, Chasing Space, a book a lot of our listeners may well be very familiar with. He'd been a NASA administrator and communicator for the Office of Education. And if you want to talk about what it's like to prepare, exist, and then rehabilitate from being in microgravity, Neil, I couldn't imagine a better guest. Neil, if you'd like to introduce him, I please. would be delighted to. Uh, uh, an old friend, Leland, dude, Leland Melvin. Hey, what? How are you feeling, man? So good to be here. You know, sports and space—it's something that uh, we all should gravitate towards. I mean, yeah. we're all in space. Oh, saw what around. you did there. We see sports what you space. did there. Yeah. Gra- gravitate. <laughs> saw it. Caught it, Leland. I caught it. Oh, oh. I'm trying I'm to, to be so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So you're retired NASA astronaut. You're a former NFL wide receiver with the Detroit Lions and the Dallas Cowboys. Ooh. For a minute. For a minute. Okay. It's a minute more okay. than the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. you, you only, so, so what you're saying is only for a minute you were with the Cowboys. Both. With, yeah. I pulled a hamstring in both training camp with the Cowboys and the Lions. And I, I thank actually Danny White for helping me get the space. I'll right. talk to you about that later. Wow. Okay. Okay. You wow. Pulled a hammy. Wow. Okay. Hammy. All right. But you were on Wide the team. Wide receivers and hammies, you know, they, yeah. they kind of go, you need that, right? But I tell yeah. you what, Leland, there'll be a journey to get that far right. that, that will make you uh, an elite athlete by a long yeah. stretch. Yeah. You oh, made yeah. the team. That's all that counts. Right. 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 Yeah, there yeah. you go. And also you were a science communicator with NASA because after you did your astronaut thing, you headed up the education office at right. NASA, uh, the Office of Education, I think is the official title for it. But um, before then, you had two missions on the space shuttle Atlantis, three spacewalks, logged more than 500 hours in space. So you're you the man wow. for the show. This, hey, just trying to inspire those that next generation, Neil. You know, that's oh, what it's all. Well, well, Leland, you you failed. 
What? What? <laughs> what? Come on. What? Have you have you seen the next generation, man? <laughs> have, no. you, have you met them, man? <laughs> no. No. Wait. Chuck's got it backwards. Chuck, the next generation is fine. Uh, so, Leland, you've been paying too much attention to the young folk. They're fine. It's the old folk that are messing up the world. It's uh, true. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Right. So let me ask. So, so, so I'll start this off because we have a hundred thousand questions we want to ask you. Yeah. Um, what did you weigh when you were recruited by the Detroit Lions or the Cowboys? What did you, what, what did you weigh? I was uh, two two twenty. Wow, two twenty, yeah. not too bad. That's and great then, for a wide receiver. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And, and so four, then, and a four five forty at two hundred twenty pounds. I didn't ask all the rest. I didn't ask all that. Nah, <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> dude, I don't. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. That's like somebody saying, what did you get in chemistry? And you're like, oh, yeah, I got a 98 in chemistry, but I also got a 96 in physics. I got an 87 in <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you, okay. man. I don't blame you. All right. <laughs> so, so, so you were 220. Now, astronauts, at least from the old days, are famously little, all right, right? because you have to fit inside of a capsule. But in the right. shuttle era, it's basically a living room with a couch compared to the old days of the capsule. But, and how tall are you also, by the way? Uh, six foot. Six foot. So you weren't you a little chunky for that journey? Wow. So, so wow. on the, on wait the a flight minute. Wait, wait, and Are you wait. eating the food that other astronauts wanted to eat? Are you Leland, taking up seat space? I'm starving. Wait, let, me, let me just say this. Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, only Neil could, could term it in those, in the, uh, phrase it in those terms. You are six feet. 220, mostly muscle. And he's like, it's not Hollywood, man. You're like, aren't you a little chunky for this role? <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, but, Chuck, but, he is right. He is okay. right. Because when you're on the flight deck with someone else sitting beside you, I'm a mission specialist and another one sitting beside me, and the shoulders and the breath, it, it pushes into his space. Right. So maybe not chunky, but voluminous, maybe. Right. Uh, so did you have to lose bulk? To no. go on a space mission? No, no, right. no. He just took up both armrests. <laughs> <laughs> Lift and this is my team. And this is my team. Mine. <laughs> oh, the person dude. you don't want in the middle seat of the play airplane because they take up right. both of your armrests. <laughs> All right, I just have to lead off with that question just to. Oh figure no! That okay, out. so here, here they come, Leland. So. Uh, Better up. That's my um, name. My nickname is now Chunky. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Is, I mean, how do you as an astronaut combat effects of microgravity before you go up into space? So what sort of protocols are you going to go through? What to, kind of pregame do you have for that? Yeah, Pregame, yeah. I mean, the, the main thing is, you know, cardiovascular shape. You want to be, you know, you want to run, you want to do you know, cycling, different things, swimming. It was great. But the other thing is really, it's the free weights. And, you know, and as a football player, mm -hmm. free weights have been always part of my regimen for, you know, strength and endurance and all of that. But we find that if you lift free weights, whether it's on the ground or actually the equivalent of free weights in space, it keeps your bones from getting osteoporotic. When, when you go to space, the morphology of your bone structure changes because there is no gravity. Well, we're we're yeah. in free fall around the planet. There was actually gravity, nine, what, nine tenths of a G in 240 miles up. But your bones start to change. And when you come home, if you haven't done resistive exercise, your, your bones may be embrittled. You will come back, you will get stress fractures. And so it's really important that you precondition with, you know, lifting free weights, especially, you know, squats and deadlifts to 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 work the the big bones in your body, your hip bones. So just to be clear, no, some wait, wait, just to be clear, because some people listening to this may be from the deep geek spectrum have never done sports. When you say free weights, these aren't weights that cost no money. These are <laughs> weights. <laughs> these, these are the heavy weights. Yeah, so heavy. These, these are weights that live in each hand, and yes. you move them in whatever way you choose rather Inch than be press, constrained. Individual press, you know, those kind of things. So yeah. you're not taking those into space because Neil has taught us it's $10,000 a pound to get yes. it <laughs> up there. So you know, no taking oh, free minute, weights Wait a minute, wait a minute. $10,000 a pound. Leland, you were chunky. You were damn real fat. This Holy is what God. I was talking Being about, Chuck. You know <laughs> what was, this was an expensive boy to put up in space. Hey, tell me about it. They were having <laughs> meetings. They were having meetings about you. 
They he were, needs to lose weight what can we before amputate? he goes. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, let's give Leland a little bit of love before we, <laughs> <laughs> we take okay. him down. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> but go on. When you get up into the space station, you're there for a, a certain period of time. Your exercise regime still has to be in place. So A, what are you doing? And I can't imagine there's already a gym waiting for you there. So you're going to have this equipment to set up, exercise, and then dismantle. So how much of your whole day does it take to go from beginning to packing it away in the box, wherever it is? But just to be clear, just to be clear, Leyland was on the space shuttle, which doesn't spend months in space. So we might ask, what preparation do you need for just the days or weeks on a shuttle relative to the months on a space Mm -hmm. station? So that that would be two different- Point taken. Question there, right. yeah. Leyland, go so, for it. So short duration space flight, you know, a week or two weeks at a time, we had a cycle ergometer. We could set up this, this bicycle in the mid deck of the space shuttle. So you would go down, you would you would strap in, you strap your body in so you don't start pedaling and float away and your feet are in straps and so you're, you're cycling. And then we had these rubber bands that we would stretch to do resistive exercise yeah. because that's, that's what you need is that resistive exercise. But on the space station, when people are living there for six months or a year, we have a machine called the resistive exercise device that has these bands that allow you to do the equivalent of what we just talked about with the free weights. So you can do bench press, deadlift, overhead press, curls. We have a cycle ergometer up there and we have a treadmill. And on that treadmill, so that you can get the the cardiovascular shape, you need two hours of exercise a day for long duration space flight. So the lifting and the running or the cycling. And we had actually Sonny Williams. No, you know Sonny. Yeah, I do know Sonny. I love her. Yeah, it's great. Sonny Williams was one of my classmates. She's a marathoner. She's a just an incredible athlete. She ran the Boston Marathon in space <laughs> while Karen Nyberg ran the actual Boston Marathon. And they were comparing times as they were running. An incredible. incredible. Yeah, but, but one of them didn't have gravity. <laughs> no, Chuck. What I'm he just, said was, but Chuck. So Chuck. she cheated? Are you saying she shouldn't have? Yes, I am. I'm saying <laughs> she cheated. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but now that you brought it up. <laughs> so that's, well, so I'm, that's, I'm that, going to let you tell that to Sonny, okay? Wait, wait, okay? Just to be clear, just to be clear, she has devices that weigh her down onto the treadmill. Yes, that's the it. whole thing. Okay. It's probably yes. harder up there, Chuck, than it is on the ground. She's got this this elastic band around her waist with straps that go down to the base of the treadmill. Yeah. So she's running and trying not to, you know, levitate up, but those bands are keeping her down on the treadmill. Right. And that's yeah. going to affect her, her, her actual technique. So she's going to okay. have to learn a new technique to run with all of that equipment attached to it. Exactly. All right, exactly. I take it back. I take it back. So no cheating. She had no a, cheating. She, she was, a she was actually she was at a disadvantage. Yeah. You know? Did you take a pigskin up into the shuttle and start losing that thing around? The NF the NFL Hall of Fame gave me a football to take the space, and we also took Gary the the NFL Super Bowl coin for the 2010 Super Bowl. Nice. So we flipped Sweet. the coin in space. And, and, and it never came down. And it never came down. It's at Jupiter yeah. now. Right. Yeah. Right. Everybody's still waiting for the game to start. I know, right? <laughs> They're just sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> we did rocks, paper, scissors to decide who was going to get the toss. So you, you prepare to go to space. You do your thing while you're up there. And once you return, there's these effects that and consequences. But how did you feel about the return and is it the same for everybody or do we have a, a, a personal variation in the way things present oh, right interesting so gary as a professional athlete yourself you really understand how your body works yeah. in 3d space and you know jumping up to kick a soccer ball or mm-hmm. walking or running or whatever and when i came back you know it took me probably about a week to get back to some semblance of normalcy because your vestibular system your inner ear in space, we, it, it's the data that it's giving because if there's a little rocks in your inner ears are floating, all that data is wrong. So yeah. when you start you know, moving and turning and trying to figure out what orientation you're in, you, that's when you sometimes get sick because your eyes see one thing and your ears are telling you something else. 
and your brain is confused. And so your brain shuts all that down and then just looks at your eyes for orientation. But when you come home, it's trying to reintegrate the, the inner ear data. And now there's this conflict. And so if you're walking in a straight line and then just start a turn, you could just fall over because the data now is trying, your brain is really screwed up trying to figure it out. So every astronaut will fail a sobriety test. <laughs> Coming exactly. back. So, Officer, I am not drunk. I just got back from space. <laughs> yeah, and then he'll go, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so how do you, two things. I mean, I've just got off a plane yesterday and at a transatlantic flight, so I've got some jet lag. Mm -hmm. Do you do you then experience a similar thing from returning from space? And how how do you work with time? Because you don't have the same sort of reference points unless, of course, everything's tethered to a certain time zone back on Earth. Right. Wait, so you're saying we have jet lag. You wonder if there is something called called uh, rocket lag. lag. Rocket lag. lag. Yeah, yeah. Rocket lag. And, and aren't you on the time zone of Houston because they're the ones yapping at you all the time? Well, we always have multiple watches on with different time zones. So you might have your home time zone. You have GMT. Um, you know, you have uh, also you have mission control. So you have all different time zones. But, but Gary, when you come home, wait, your wait, body, why do you care what time it is in Greenwich, England when you're in space? Because you, the, space sta the space station is, is kind of slave to that because you have. People all over the world working. Oh, that's the agreed the upon. Time. I got it. There you go. Plus, they have a marketing deal with the watchmakers. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> but it is yeah. an international all, space station. And, and, they, and they all listen to the BBC. So. Exactly. Yeah. So I wouldn't you, be. Man, you all over this. <laughs> <laughs> when I got home, my, uh, you know, because you've been floating and doing this floating, I went to bed and I got up to go use the bathroom, like most people do in the middle of the night. And I started pushing off of my back like I was just going to float to the toilet. Wait, wait, just to be clear, older men get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Okay. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for introducing confess, that. Yeah. You confess the state of your prostate in that in that sentence. But go on. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, well, listen. If you drink a lot of water before you go to bed, too. There right? you oh, go. Okay. Thank okay. you. We're Hydration. just properly hydrated. <laughs> Hydration. Here we, Here we go. We're properly hydrated. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. but your brain, your brain is still thinking that you're in space and mm -hmm. you're trying to navigate now the one G, the one gravitational pull world. And so you think you can do things that you were doing in space. Like if you're eating a meal, you might have a plate, you put them on a plate and then you just let go of it and turn around <laughs> and the plate hits the ground. <laughs> because in space, it just, everything just floats. Okay. What is it harder to do? Prepare for a space mission or recover from a space mission. And, you know, as as we've discussed, a professional athlete, a former professional athlete like yourself is so conscious of their body because they've used it to, to do their business. So I'd be interested to hear how you feel about either side of a space mission. Okay. Again, back to, as Neil said, the short duration space shuttle versus the long duration ISS living. Mm -hmm. Very different. You know, I basically had a vestibular system issue for about a week trying to, you know, navigate turning and moving in, in 3D space and just, you know, not being cardiovascularly in shape like I was before I left because I was running, I was doing all this stuff. But people that go long duration, they come back and they have all kinds of things happen. Like there's something called the interocular pressure in your head that yeah. pushes on your eyeballs, eyeballs. That's right. And causes you to have to wear glasses if you haven't had to wear glasses before. And that is not necessarily reversible when you come home. So they're still trying mm. to do the research to figure that part out. Mm. Um, you know, your, your muscle atrophy, your bone density, those things do diminish a little bit. But if you do the two hours of exercise, cardio and, and the weightlifting equivalent, you, um, you know, you can, you can, Kind of mitigate some of those. Whoa! Problems. Did you say two hours? That's two every hours day? day. Yeah, every day they have to work out two hours a day. They have Part got the a space gym. Wow! <laughs> Basically, that's every, cool. that's every every astronaut has to do the same yes. thing. So yes. um, you know, ma imagine you're having to stagger your rotor, right? If you've got jobs and tasks that you need to fulfill, but you still need to fulfill the two hours per day. It's there's but so much schedule, more involved. 
they schedule that into your day, though. I mean, mm-hmm. you have the yeah. planners on the ground that put that in for you because that's that's a countermeasure that we use to stay stay healthy. And and when do they schedule the couch and potato chip time? <laughs> that's on your time. You have to figure that out. <laughs> Leland, a last question before we let you go. Can you imagine a future where we find a planet that has slightly more gravity than Earth and you bring an entire athletic team there to work out under these heavier gravity conditions and then bring them back to Earth and have them kick ass in whatever sport they're in? That's, Would called, this- that's called cheating. That's called cheating. Okay. <laughs> just, just so I happen to have my own damn rocket, okay? <laughs> Elon might be is doing it cheating? That. Is it? We we take athletes to altitude train to high altitude, warm is that weather, cheating? and we extra oxygen oxygenate their blood. Is that cheating? And everybody That's, does it. So everybody does it. Just but get Gary, your own rocket, dude. But does everyone have that access to it? Right. Right. Oh, access to opportunity. Right. Does everybody that's, a part of that? All right. That is. That's what the Russians argue all the time. They're like everyone has access to steroids. So. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. Leland, we're going to let you go. Uh, it's been a delight to. I haven't seen you in a long time. Great to see you and to have you on the show, Leland. We got to say goodbye to you, but start. Talk will continue uh, with Dr. Shana Gifford, who's otherwise known as the Space Doc. Let's find out why when Star Talk returns. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition, Space Cowboy. Gary, who'd you bring in for the second segment? Well, we've spoken to the Space Cowboy, and that's obviously a reference to Leland Melvin's time as a Dallas Cowboy. Couldn't resist the title. What I from from speaking with with Leland all the questions start to tumble as to how you prepare, how you recover, what you do while you're there, but then throw that forward even further into, with the answers we get to those questions, how does that enlighten what we do in terms of space travel in the future? How does it educate and direct us? So for that, we need someone in the medical profession who has an experience of dealing with with these sort of uh, cases. The perfect person is Dr. Shana Gifford. Now this, as we remember at the beginning of the show, is self-titled The Space Doc. The reason being, she was from the 2015-2016 High Seas 4 one-year mission to virtual Mars. So to go through that whole discipline, that whole knowledge set exists in one person. So for me, this is our perfect follow-up guest. Shana, Shana Gifford, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you, Neil. Excellent. And I, I, I see on your uh, resume here, resident physician in rehabilitation <laughs> at University oh. of Washington, St. Louis. That was a long time. Well, that was a long time ago. We're flashing back. I graduated from that program. Yes, at Wash U here in beautiful St. Louis, we did home it. of the we arch, center of, our, center of our country. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And so tell us about High Seas. What, what was that about? All right. The uh, Hawaii uh, Space um, Exploration Analog and Simulation. Is what Ooh, so it's acronym. High C's is a high C's. See, see what you did there. Yeah. Isn't, yeah. isn't it always an acronym, though? It always In is. In space, it always it's is. always yes. an acronym. In fact, maybe my name is an acronym. I should probably check on it. <laughs> um, so, so what do you mean a one year virtual mission to Mars? Does that make you a virtual doctor? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'm if I'm taking care of you over the internet, it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good one. Good one. I like so, it. So yeah, no, I mean virtual missions, I may, I may. Virtu- I'm an analog astronaut. I've participated in space simulations. My first was for NASA at Johnson Space Center, locked in a big air hangar in a spacecraft. And they locked they locked us in. They shut the doors. And all we saw on the screens was space for about a week until they told us to get in our rocket ship and explore an asteroid. And then they flew us home. We had mission control, the whole setup. It was very real and very wow. scary at times. And then we did so well on that that two of us got sent up to simulated Mars for a year. And we spent a year living on the side of a barren, although not totally unactive volcano. The volcano occasionally woke up and reminded us we were on a volcano. But hey. You spent a year? Yeah. I'm, I'm, 366 wait, 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 did days. I hear, did I hear you correctly? A year? Neil, you know I did. I made you a movie from there. And there's no, I know, but I still don't believe, it's still, it's still crazy. And there's no, there was no, like, 
vending machine with Twinkies in it or something. You, oh, you I didn't say to, that. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what else? What else would you take to Mars? Twinkies never spoil. Well, let's see the they Pringles, PB and J. Yeah, yeah. A, an entire hospital full of equipment, nurses, phlebotomists. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that would be great. Unfortunately, I literally had a doctor bag, like the doctors of old. Really? That's, that's what I had for a whole year. Mm-hmm. Uh, like a little black doctor's bag, like yes. the, like like a Norman Rockwell doctor bag. Yeah, yeah, Indeed. And, it, a, and it unbuckles open and opens up. Yeah, it right. has a brass latch and everything. Well, so, I would I would have think they would have at least like played it off and gave you one of those little tricorder readers that they from Star Trek. <laughs> oh, oh, and they did, and it had a little laser function. Everything made great fun sounds, but it didn't actually do anything. Unfortunately, it was very disappointing. <laughs> so it made the let's, sound let's, though. Let's, that's, let's what, get, that's what you let's need. Get the this sound. into an interesting subject because <laughs> Wait, what, what, you mentioned food. One question food. before you go, Bert, but, go on, uh, Gary. Go on. I got it because you know I got to do this because uh, you're, you're the space doc. Did you ever even just mess with somebody? Turn to anyone and go, he's dead, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or say, I'm a doctor, not a butcher, damn it, or something like that. Yeah, you know, but when a colleague's spacesuit almost caught on fire and he had to come out of the airlock so that it didn't catch on fire, I thought to myself, am I a doctor? I'm a doctor, not a fireman, right? Yes, right. Okay, you can't, your spacesuit can't catch on fire. That's right out. But you got you to say that, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you got to say it. it. I'm a I'm doctor, a, not a fireman. Not damn a it. fireman. <laughs> not a fireman. Damn it. That's right. Uh, that sounds like a practical joke that went wrong. It, but, uh, um, it, it everything <laughs> goes wrong in space. Catches on fire. This, this is why we practice. This is why we do, do space simulations because everything that can go wrong in space will go wrong fantastically in space. You mentioned, I mean, all right, we got onto Twinkies and everything else. And mm-hmm. then you realize you're not up there with a, kitchen, a fully functional kitchen. But you must be doing something up there to get some fresh produce. Are you growing? Are you culturing? What's happening in that environment? Or is it all like, you know, what, stick a dollar in the machine and out comes whatever it is you need? And just to be clear, it's not up there. It's in there, right? Where, where yeah. was this? In, in our dome, dome on the range, dome on the volcano, we did actually have a fully functional kitchen because it started as a food study. In fact, we had a gourmet kitchen, but on the ISS, they don't exactly have a gourmet kitchen. And in the experiment at NASA, we were the rehydrators in chief. We literally had a a bag of warm water and we injected it into our meals, shook it vigorously and enjoyed. This worked well, except for the cereal. When you rehydrate cereal, which had milk powder on it, it does not go well. Those Cheerios, those Cheerios do not hold up. Mm. I'm just saying, but no, um, we grow to answer your question, Gary, we grow, we culture, we cultivate, but in small volume space is at a premium in space. So you can get some micronutrients and some macronutrients space is at a premium in space Space is at a premium. So really we would, we could grow as much as we needed to to live, but we don't have the space in space to do that. So we were Uh, discussing with Leland about, you know, you, you, your, your bones and the density Mm-hmm. Is there anything you as a doctor can do to, to mitigate those circumstances or have we already done it by adjusting the gravity within the environment you're in? Yeah, because Chuck would just rather take a pill and go back to his couch and not have to spend two We've hours. We've tried that, Chuck. We've tried that. I would like that. to take a pill and do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see that. I could see you doing that. Just about anything. Next time we meet, I'm going to give you some pills and ask you to do some things. So hold All on right. to that thought. Um, yeah, you know, we've tried everything. We have tried pills called bisphosphonates, which we give to people with osteoporosis on Earth who don't mm-hmm. have enough bone. Right. It turns out that the risks outweigh the benefits. We weren't getting a lot out of it. So we stopped doing that. We do supplement, though, calcium and phosphorus and other things you need, just like on Earth, to build boat. So in my patients who are in wheelchairs who don't load their skeletons by walking, in space you don't load your skeleton by walking, we heavily supplement vitamin D calcium. There's those things you need to scaffold and build bone. So the astronauts get get their vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. And then like Leland was saying, two hours a day of exercise where we load people on the T2 treadmill by putting a waistband on them and literally bungee cording them to the treadmill so that they do some advancing and they do some strikes. It's the foot strikes. Right. It's that, it's, it's that the pounding, pad. right? Yeah. The pounding. I, I read a uh, study years ago that talked about how runners 
actually have better bone density because of the pounding, which is also something that wears their bones. So it was this weird kind of, you got to find this equilibrium. It's, yeah, it's a rejuvenative thing. I mean, if it doesn't break your bones and give you shin splints, it'll make you better. That's <laughs> right. That's the point. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or for my Boston Marathoners, if it doesn't make you pass out after mile 20. Right. right. But you know, right. I used to take care of marathoners, uh, sportsmen, sportswomen. Mm. And during COVID, they stopped running for a while. They told everyone just stay indoors. And immediately all these people developed knee pain, hip pain, back pain. And they came into my office and they said, Doc, I've been running 20, 30, 40 miles a week for years. Why am I hurting now? And uh, I said, because you stopped. Right. You stopped. And, and, and I, feel, I feel that yeah. way about drinking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you've been ex- you've been treating not- your existential pain with alcohol but Chuck, you, right. you haven't you haven't stopped drinking so how do you know <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh my god that was so well played i'm at a that loss was, that was so well played and there's no there's no comeback just there shut up now no- Chuck. oh, oh, stop. oh Does she went just- top gun on me <laughs> she just it's uh, like, okay, look, Chuck is okay, in the penalty wait, box for me, 10 minutes. Yeah, let me let me defer, Shayna. I will now be uh, goose <laughs> to your maverick. You can be maverick now. I got to be All goose. Right. Chuck, All I'm right. feeling the need for speed. I think okay. our director oh, would like us go. to move on here. Oh, uh, that was yes. great. All right, sorry, All right. go ahead. Okay. All right, so there was a mission astro access experiment mm-hmm. that you were involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, these. The, uh, am I right here, the para-astronauts? Correct. And yeah. then if you look at that in, in a microgravity, were these people actually able to propel themselves upright rather than not have to be wheelchair propelled? And how is this developing in terms of astronauts? That's a great question. So Mission Astro Access, um, we put, myself, two flight surgeons put, and, and a whole team, an amazing team, put 12 people who I say are adapted visually. Some of them had no sight, um, auditorially or vestibularly. Some of them had no, no hearing. And then mobility-wise, some of them propelled by wheelchairs on Earth. But you put them in space with their arms, with their own arms, or in the case of, of, of Dana Bowles, who's, who works for NASA and was one of our wonderful ambassadors, she was born without arms or legs. So she propels uh, by a via electric wheelchair beautifully and has worked for NASA for many years. Um, they in, in, in microgravity or lunar gravity or Martian gravity, we had all kinds of gravity during this mission. Um, many of them could, could, could stand, could extend into full extension. And the look on their face when you haven't stood in 12 years or 10 years, when you haven't extended without many people helping you or without having to hold onto a bar when mm. of your own free will, you wow. just stood. It was incredible. And one of our ambassadors, who has a very rare genetic condition, stood on his own for the first time in his life wow. in, lunar, in lunar gravity. Oh, it was remarkable. It was amazing. remarkable. Eric, you are amazing. So let me ask this follow-up question. Are para-astronauts teaching scientists now of maybe how being adaptive in a microgravity will help future space endeavors? I think para-astronauts and para-athletes, people who are adapted to life on Earth and have to function differently here all the Mm. time. You know, you put high-functioning people like Leland, who are literally rock stars, superstars, star athletes, you put them in space and suddenly they're disabled. They have to learn how to function in that environment. You take people on Earth who are who are labeled as disabled, but they function beautifully. You put them in a new environment and they just flip on a dime. They know what mm. it means to adapt. They know what it means to change, to have to do things differently, to not be suited to the environment you're in. They are right. so much better and faster at this than any of us ever will be that I think they have a lot to teach us. I really do. I can't wait till we get one of them up there. That, so was, are you uh, saying- that was the premise of the movie. What's the movie where the blue people on the planet pandora but the main character thank you avatar but the main power he was a paraplegic and because he couldn't use his legs he immediately acclimated to the avatar he was he was completely used to just changing his mental environment right really how we function in the world is about our mental model of the world and what we're supposed to be able to do and how we function when your mental model is I'm going to make it happen no matter what. You cannot stop me, which is the mental model of every single adapted, every single disabled person in the world. Right. You, then you put them in a new environment, they're just going to adapt. It doesn't so take are we, are we looking at this? I'll, I'll call it the standard body shape. Mm-hmm. Ma- maybe not being the best solution in a microgravity environment. It goes to being 
one of many possible solutions, one of mm. many possible ways to be not the best way, just a way. And now okay. Sawyer, for example, Sawyer uh, works for NASA as well down in Florida uh, at uh, Kennedy Space Center. You know, he's been uh, ambulating, propelling with a wheelchair for many years. You put Sawyer at the International Space Station, he's going to move around as well as anyone else. And he's not going to try to use his feet. It wouldn't occur to him to do that. Everything is going to be arm powered and he's going to be fast much faster than people who are used to walking are going to be the second you put Sawyer up there. And Sawyer, we're going to get you up there, my friend. You just yeah. wait. So so it sounds like it's not only from what we learned from Leland, what you do with your body to get in shape, but your mind as well. Mm -hmm. The adaptability of your mind and how it then thinks about your body seems right. to be at least half the effort up there in space. I'd say it's closer to 80%. Oh, 80%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, right, the other 20% is yeah. following the procedure, the checklist that says, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And by the way, Chuck, there is a point in the checklist where you get to it and you're like, time to panic. Oh. oh <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I would take a break and we're going to come back to that in the third segment of Star Talk Sports Edition, Space Cowboy and Space Cowboy Doctor. <laughs> Space Doc on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition. We're talking about being a space cowboy and being a space doc relevant to that. We've got Dr. Shana Gifford here. Who, Shana, your expertise is rehabilitation, is that right? That's correct. So uh, we got to hear Leland Melvin talk about, uh, he didn't use the word rehabilitate, but readjust mm -hmm. to 1G after being in 0G. Um, and he gave us some details about his auditory canal and his brain and his. So, what role do you play in this, or they just have to shake it off over a week of, of Earth gravity? <laughs> can can you help this? Can you? What, can. What's your role in getting astronauts to get back to one dream? So we can shake it off, and we call it reacclimate. Kind of like you reacclimate to coming down from an altitude or to traveling to another time zone. There's things you can do. One of them is sleep. Hmm. While they've been on the ISS, we we give them that. we give them <laughs> I believe you. We we give them eight hours a night to sleep, but they usually don't. They usually get closer to six for a lot of reasons that are complicated. So we get back to Earth, we say, sleep, please sleep. And then we say, remember, when you put down the water bottle, it won't float. You need to put it down with your hand on, on a surface. And then they say, okay, and they drop it. We say, that's okay. Try yeah. again. <laughs> try again and you know they get it after a few times so all of that clicks into gear very quickly they stop dropping things they start remembering that you can't just you know put stuff down it's not going to be there when you reach for it again but then when it comes to the walking that takes a while a little while to come back so which is why every picture you see of every astronaut they're being flanked by someone on either side as they're walking away typically or they're standing still but when they go to walk down a straight corridor there'll often be one person on either side because they may start to drift Wow. And they may start to drift because the fluid in your inner ear, it's continued to swish around in space, but the sensors that pick up that swishing have shut themselves down after the first few days to a week in space. They just said, we don't need you. And they, they literally turn off in most people. Wow. So the ability to sense where am I in space relative to my body and the walls and other things in space, that's off for a little while. And it takes a little while to come back. And we can do some vestibular retraining. We do that with them, people who've had strokes, people who've had injuries. We can do some vestibular retraining to try and get that to come back more quickly. Are you talking about here that anyone who's had an extended period of time in microgravity basically becoming allergic to gravity? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's almost like you've been redesigned. Ooh, you were designed like to function well in this gravity well, one G. Like and mm. your your body now says, "Oh, all that stuff I needed for that, I don't need that anymore." Your body is amazingly good at forgetting. It's also good at remembering, but it's great at forgetting. It'll forget that dripping faucet. It's called habituation. It's going to turn that off. We don't need that. It'll forget those traumatic experiences. Maybe we don't need that. Mm. It'll forget that I need to use my legs to walk. You'll forget that. You'll even forget that on earth if you're lying in a hospital bed for too long, which is why yeah, even my right. patients have had a surgery, I say, get up. They walk and they say, doc, I can't. Yeah. You won't be able to if you don't start now. You need to get up. I know, I'm sorry. And just sit up for me. Dangle your legs, put your feet So on. that's, it's not just atrophy, muscle atrophy. That's actually something that happens with it's the neurological. connection. Yeah. It's yeah. neurological. Wow. 
you remember and you forget. So your muscles and your bones start atrophying right away. First right. thing, like anyone who's had a long illness can tell you it only takes yeah. days. And then your body starts to forget. It, the muscles forget, the bones forget, and your actual the actual circuitry starts to say, do I need to be here? I'm not being used. I don't know, not sure. And so part yeah. of rehab is reminding everything, the bones, the muscles, and the brain, this is how it's supposed to work. Now we so need if to you have together. three astronauts that return to full gravity, wherever that might be, mm-hmm. like I say, a moon base, Mars, back here on Earth, will they all present with the same symptoms? Or does it vary from individual to individual? Like everything else, there'll be, uh, there'll be shades of difference. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But everyone will still be in the same color scheme, if that makes sense. So, you are, so. you're all going to come back feeling a little blue, but it may be light blue, navy blue, midnight blue. You know, some mm-hmm. people are going to come back and they're just kind of step right back into it. Um, Mark and Scott Kelly like to say that, you know, after a few days, they were feeling pretty good. And then some people and different things come back differently. Right, just in case no one else is on a first name oh. basis with them, we're talking about the twins. <laughs> one stayed on Earth and one went up into space. Mm-hmm. And then... The one in space got the overview effect. So no, but they were, they were up for a very long time and became the, sort of the model medical experiment for the effects of space versus Earth living. You know, the and two of so, them have, are, have both been up. And then uh, one stayed home to care for his wife, uh, Gabby Giffords, after Gabby. she was, was injured. Mm-hmm. And that's the one who's currently a rep, I believe. And then Scott was the one who was up for a year. And he was good enough to call me during my mission and, and mm. wish us luck. And he was so kind. Um, nice. But they've both been. And, you know, uh, according to, to, to Endurance, which I believe is the title of Scott's book, you know, he acclimated in many ways very quickly. He was sitting at the table with his family, eating dinner there a few days after he got back. But then he woke up in the middle of the night with incredibly swollen legs. Because his body, his veins forgot how to pump the fluid back up against gravity. Right. They had just <laughs> given up doing that for so long. They didn't need to. What you, they, right, right. They didn't need to. Why did they need to? So he woke up with these very swollen legs. That was his shade. Other mm-hmm. people come back and they have different shades. They stumble more or it takes them much longer to get back to running. So we put them in special treadmills that are filled with water and yeah. they literally run in a water treadmill until they get their groove back to running on earth in full earth gravity. So everyone is back. They're back in their color. They're like, I'm feeling a little blue, but maybe it's a different shade. Everyone has their thing. Do you get sort of like pressure sores from if you've been in microgravity a long time from just sitting because you're not used to the, the, the contact? Thankfully. You mean when you come back to earth? Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, skin shearing, skin, like the health of the skin and pressure sores. Pressure sores happen when people don't have the sensation and don't know to move away from the pain. Right. Yeah. So as long as you're as long as your sense, your, your nerves are intact, hmm. usually you won't get a pressure and you can move. Right. Usually you don't get a pressure sore. What they will get, though, is the bottoms of their feet have lost all their calluses. What? The callus, oh. their calluses. So it's like going to space and get well, a pedicure. Look at that. It's the best, I've, the best pedicure I've ever had. <laughs> it's so soft and smooth. Mm. It's so smooth. So, so they get calluses on the tops of their feet oh. because they're always hooking, oh, they're hooking the hooks on. at the workstation. Yeah. Uh, and the bottoms of their feet literally shed and it is super gross. Okay. As that's one a, of the, all of them have pictures of it and it's gross. Yeah. Well, and that's a they, bad, they, that's a bad trade off. They, they come back to earth and they have to redevelop their calluses. Yeah. Their feet. Yeah. Nobody's looking at the bottom of my feet when I'm wearing some flip flops. Wow. So, 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 so it's like they're ever looking at the bottom of your feet. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Very good point, Shana. <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, so <laughs> what, what you're saying is that the, uh, the bottoms of the feet look like they're molting or something. Is that they, correct? They, yes. They are shedding. They're shedding skin. Wow. It's quite a thing. Let's, I mean, with all of this experience and knowledge that we've gained, how, how do we need to overcome the physiological issues to, say, take us from Earth to the moon, maybe to Mars or further, and not find ourselves having to deal with all of these problems once you return to a full gravity? We haven't. Right. Well, wouldn't it be, We're wouldn't the solution it. be to create gravity in space? So two thousand artificial space and Odyssey. artificial gravity. Sure. If you've got a, a 2001 space odyssey type solution where part of the station rotates, that will, that will give you some, some relief. It will. It should give you a hundred percent relief. Why not? 
Why not? So, because when you lock somebody in a box away from- Oh, that's from, different, okay. <laughs> the, the isolation piece is still there. The radiation piece is still there. Even if you've given mm -hmm. someone gravity back. And, and the homicidal computer, you know- Please don't give them that. Please skip on the how. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's pass, let's not stop for 200. Let's pass right past how. They will still have immune system issues. They may yes. still have psychological issues. Wow. And they still have to worry about radiation. Unless we've come okay, up with so that. Do we have a magic wand for that too? I would really you like You know that. what's funny? It just dawned on me that what you said, we are seeing the effects of from just the pandemic. And we weren't even locked in a box. We were just locked in our homes. I mean, unfortunately, with our families. But still, <laughs> that was... <laughs> Well, now we know how Chuck feels about his family. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I hey, make hey. no bones about it. Shana. Honey, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Say nice listening. things. Yeah. Um, that was for you. I can understand the calcium bone situation, but how does our immune system begin to suffer in space? Because you're in an environment that is pristine, or is it? Am I wrong there? It, Wouldn't that yeah, be the I would, problem? I would not call the ISS pristine. I don't think Leland or anyone who's been up would call our space environments pristine. Okay. It's um, it's uh, you know, it's a it's a vehicle one yard shy of a football stadium. It's an enormous, enormous place that people have been. The space station is. The, the space station, station is. The station mm -hmm. is. Yes. Yeah, so 109 meters long, and we've been inhabiting it for 20 years. Ew. And we've never sent up <laughs> a full blown cleaning service. Ew. So um, I wouldn't call it pristine, mm. but I would an say- An I astronaut's exercising two hours a day. Two hours Ooh. a day, every day for the last 20 years. And do they years? recycle the water from people's sweat and pee? Oh, and Everything. No, they just open this a window and let it out. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I gotta go with Gary. You could just roll down a window for so a few minutes what, and what let happens, some fresh air in. So, so NASA's, NASA's uh, uh, Brian Crucian, who's the, the expert in this, will tell you that a couple things happen. When uh, anyone here box, you have a box and you got to get your elbows down and your guard up and you get in your stance. So our immune system's like a boxer. It's looking out to, for the bad guy. It's looking, it's ready. And then in space, the, our one immune cell called a cytokine, which is kind of like, kind of like a referee. It tells our immune system where to aim. It gets really confused. It's like, where, where, where am I looking again? Cause normally that the, the, you, you got to square off against the person in front of you, but right. suddenly, yeah. And um, people sometimes their immune systems react in strange ways. Childhood diseases reactivate. Um, they get strange rashes, wow. uh, but it, it again it varies. Everyone's different, mm. but um, the immune damn Shane, I don't want to go into space yeah. anymore. I'm telling you, <laughs> you I see? mean seriously, it, it kind of sounds worse than being at one of those one-hour motels. That you, it's, <laughs> what's yeah, happening so, uh, to you in those? Motels? Never been, Chuck. I don't know what your situation is. <laughs> I was very uh, sleepy. I needed a nap. Yeah, yeah. for an hour. This, yeah, okay. You took the pill, didn't you? So, um, <laughs> what you've just described, Shana, sounds horrible. So, why would we want to put ourselves through all of that? Well, this also happens to people on submarines, Gary. Yeah. And this happens to people on aircraft carriers and in Antarctica every single year. And every great mission and every just great to be clear, in Antarctica, the there, there's a research station mm -hmm. and no one is, is frolicking or on the ice sheets. They're, they're basically inside with each other. You know, right? we, and then uh, they do they do frolic a little in the snowmobiles, but um, you know, it's been it's been there for fifty years, and people spend people overwinter every single year, and they're kind of locked up on the base a little bit yeah. during that time. I, I have to tell you though, you really didn't answer Gary's question. Why? He said this sounds awful. Why would people want to do this? And then you said, well, they also want to be in submarines and Antarctica, and all those things off also sounded awful. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was just saying it was not a unique problem to the, U, the, the U.S. Yeah. Navy is now writing you a love letter, Chuck. <laughs> Chuck has always known he was the wrong stuff, right? For the uh, military. You know what? Listen, Neil, I, I know you're kind of joking, but I think you. I'm going to put that as, as on my tombstone. <laughs> Chuck stuff. Nice. Chuck Nice is the right stuff for a nice cushy seat in Mission Control. Oh, that's what Chuck read. So, as I like all to right. say, space needs everybody, but it doesn't need you all in the same place at the same time. Ooh. It needs some of you in mission control, that nice cushy seat, the warm coffee. It needs some of you building the rocket. It needs some of you launching the rocket. It needs some of you repairing the. It needs some of you in the rocket in space. It needs everybody to be where you need to be. And some people love this. I love this. 
Mark and Scott Kelly love this. Leland loves this. And maybe you love your coffee and your air on chair and mission control, Chuck. There's a place for us all in space. It's just not maybe in space. Let me and just, just to say be- this. Failure is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> if we cannot travel in space without this discomfort, these problems, are we stuck on our little blue marble? Absolutely not. And by the way, we're going to get over that discomfort. I think some very rich and very people very used to comforts have been in space now Hmm. and they've done just fine. In fact, they came back crying. If I recall, William Shatner, Mm -hmm. you know, he's not a hard player. He's not passing the pigskin as Leland is. The man lives a comfortable life, but he came Mm -hmm. back from his seven minute exposure to microgravity in tears, Mm -hmm. barely able to speak so profoundly moved. And he's not a sentimental man. And so I'm going to say it's. I and, think he's, and, and he's hardly ever a man for no words. The right. man can talk. He yeah, can talk. He, is, he really can. He's well nigh verbose, kind of like Chuck. So yeah. I would say it's a place for us all to go for some period of time, maybe just a brief glimpse or maybe for the rest of our lives. It's what do you need mm. out of it? What's going to be your best trip to space? Make that trip. Mm. Okay. Wow. Space needs me, apparently. Space yeah. needs you. In whichever role that uh, I can find. In, in, right. in whatever capacity. And Listen. right now, for the low, low price of $110,000, you can go. <laughs> you know, the, fir- the first airline tickets were that much. That's the first, right. The wait, first wait. civilians who went, out, went flying after World War II paid a wow. lot of money. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 was, it was kind of a luxury curiosity mm-hmm. more than it was a mm-hmm. mode of transportation. And T minus 60 years later, save up a little bit, you know, on your summer job and you're off. In fact, there's it's a line in a Cole Porter song, uh, the one, I get no kicks from champagne. One of the lines is, uh, I, I get no kicks in a plane. So, really? so that was a, the plane was a reference point for people huh. who would take thrill rides in that right. song when that song was written. Yeah. So I'm just showing off my Broadway knowledge there. There you go. So, yeah. So Shana, I think we're going to have to call it quits there. But that, oh, we, no. We've got to end on that note where you I said you, Chuck, though. There's, there's a little <laughs> bit of, uh, there's a little bit of space experience for us all that could possibly change us for the better forever. There's that, something uh, out there. Get out there. Find it. Th- there's something out there for us all. All right. Uh, Gary, did you have any last questions you have to put on no, the table? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I mean, I've, I'm going to go away and unpack what we've, we've learned from yeah, the show. Yeah, it's, good, good. It's, it's pretty amazing to, to understand what astronauts like Leland Melvin have gone through and then how scientists and, and, and physicians like Shana Gifford here are able to assess, redirect, comfort, rehabilitate, and just allow us to then maybe improve these situations going forward. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I delighted learning about the, the para-astronauts. I didn't even know that was mm. a thing. They're so remarkable. Yeah. To an yeah. extent, we can that's, learn about that's that. That's eye-opening. Yeah. Dana, Mina, and all of my para astronauts, all twelve Mission Astro Access ambassadors, you guys Excellent. are amazing. Excellent. The Excellent. Shout out to them all. All right, this has been Star Talk Sports Edition, Space Cowboy and Space Docs. I want to thank Leland Melvin and Shana Gifford for giving us their time to take us where no one has gone before. <laughs> no, where hundreds have gone before, but Only most six hundred have. have gone before. Six hundred. <laughs> To boldly go where 600 have gone before. before. (laughs) All right. This has been Star Talk Sports Edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson here. Keep looking up.